I am Dwight Drummond. Tonight, it's the first day back in class for many Toronto students. And along with concerns over COVID-19, they're also dealing with schools in serious need of repair. There's horrible disrepair, and these buildings have been underfunded for 20 some odd years now. The funding to keep buildings up to date has, has been challenging. The TDSB repair backlog is nearly $4 billion. Some schools need so much work, tearing them down would be cheaper. Plus, a lot of people have told us they simply avoid Avenue Road. Virtually all motorists on Avenue Road speed. Some city residents concerned over speeding cars on Avenue Road are putting forward their own plans for a makeover of the major artery. And city was busy and today has been busy as well. Uh, as hospitality professionals, we're very excited. It's not as big as years past, but for struggling downtown businesses, the return of TIFF is already drawing rave reviews. Many of the city's students going back to school today will be heading into buildings that are in serious need of repair. Almost half of the Toronto District School Board's buildings were built more than 60 years ago, and some are more than a century old. Today, the CBC is kicking off a series looking into the state of repair at the TDSB, and as Angelina King reports, it has repair backlog of $3.7 billion, which is projected to keep growing. Annette Carling is heading into school excited this year, especially to see her students in person. To get kids back to being human with other humans um, and away from the screens. But Carling is heading back into a building that's in serious need of repair. Her school is the worst in the board, according to the Facility Condition Index, or FCI, which measures the state of a school. The higher the percentage, the worse it is. Winchester's is at 136%. The TDSB's average, 47. I think this is one when we talk about systemic um, issues within the school system. I think that's part of the issue. There are seven other schools with an FCI higher than 100, meaning it would cost more to repair it than build a new one. There are about 100 schools with an FCI of 65% or higher, something the board describes as the tipping point. There are a combination of factors. The TDSB says a high FCI doesn't mean a school is unsafe or not maintained. Often we will find that there are elements that are continue to work, continue to function, or continue to be in relatively good condition, but they, based on industry standards, are at the end of their life cycle. The TDSB started the year off with a $4.1 billion repair backlog, which now sits at $3.7 billion, nearly a quarter of the province's total backlog. This year, it received $275 million in provincial funding for repairs, less than 7% of what's needed. And these buildings have been underfunded for 20-some-odd years now. Krista Wiley is the co-founder of Fix Our Schools and says the province needs to better fund repairs to address what she says are unacceptable conditions like erratic heating. And the kids are wearing winter coats and the teacher is wearing gloves as she or he is writing on the chalkboard. So clearly when our basic human needs are not being met, learning takes a back seat. The Education Ministry says each year it spends more than $500 million to build new schools and renovate existing ones and $1.4 billion on repairs. Carling says while she loves Winchester, its condition shouldn't jeopardize teaching and learning. I would hope that it doesn't become a teacher's burden to a teacher's, a parent's or a student's burden to wonder if the space we walk into every day is safe from um, the floors I walk on to the air that I'm breathing to the lighting. Hoping a long list of repairs doesn't add to the uncertainty of another pandemic school year. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. And if you want to check out what repairs are needed at your child's school, we've listed them on our website, cbc.ca slash Toronto. We'll be running more stories about the state of Toronto schools next week. Today's return to the classroom comes with the ongoing concern about rising COVID-19 numbers. Even before the bell rang this morning, the TDSB pulled the plug on extracurricular activities. Greg Ross joins us now from Niagara Street Public School near Strawn and Adelaide. And Greg, what have you been hearing on this first day back? 
Well, Dwight, obviously pandemic safety is a top priority. Uh, the TD TDSB obviously has a number of safety protocols in place like mask mandates and physical distancing and those types of things. But uh, some of the concerns that we're hearing from parents is the fact that uh, maybe class sizes are too big. They say classes are bigger this year and it's making it more difficult for their kids to physically distance. As for the kids themselves, they're telling me they're just happy to be back in the classroom and reunited with their friends. Ready for the wait is over for school-aged kids in Toronto. Now I'm in grade two. I'm excited to see my new friends and I'm ready. Really excited to have the kids back. Um, some kids we haven't seen in over a year. For some, instead of focusing on issues surrounding the pandemic, they were able to spend some time contemplating their favorite subjects. I absolutely love math. Along with their pencils and books, they've also had to pack their masks and hand sanitizer as safety remains a pandemic priority. I don't really think the kids mind wearing masks. Masks, wash hands, keep as distance as possible when we can. But some parents are concerned about their kids' ability to physically distance themselves in class. Last year there were 21 kids or so in his class. And then this year, surprisingly, there are 31 kids in his class. With cases of the Delta variant on the rise and kids under 12 unvaccinated, there's even more reason for concern. I would think that the precautions that should be taken would be even more so with that uh, demographic. But so that's my one concern. But the TDSB says the bigger class sizes are not unexpected. What happened last year was we received some pandemic funding that allowed us to allocate more resources, including staff. We also had our students, a lot more of the students working in from home, which allowed uh, the space to be created within the schools. So the, the dynamic has changed a little bit from last year. The province is not imposing hard caps on the number of students in each class, instead asking teachers to create as much distance as possible inside classrooms. And while most kids are excited to be back, Toronto students won't have extracurricular activities to look forward to, at least in the beginning. While other regions like Peel and Halton have allowed them, the TDSB has put them on hold at the advice of public health. I'm really sad about that, but I just hope they can open it by winter. There are also safety concerns in school zones with increased traffic uh, this year, and that's something that uh, the mayor was tweeting about today. The city wants to remind people that uh, those Vision Zero safety protocols are still in place. Things like uh, automated speed enforcement cameras around school zones, and they want people to remember, slow down when you're driving near a school. And I can tell you, Dwight, it was very crowded earlier today, right out here out of, uh, in uh, front of Niagara um, Street Public School. There were parents, there was kids. There's not a lot of room here. It's important that people slow down when they're driving in these school zones. Yeah, the kids are excited, so maybe they're not paying attention, so it's very important that the drivers do. Thank you for that, Greg. Speaking of drivers, drivers going too fast, sidewalks that are too narrow, those are just some of the issues facing residents who live near Avenue Road. And now some of them have banded together along with a local architecture firm to present their vision for that street. Jessica Ng has the story. You don't have to spend long on Avenue Road north of Bloor to see a lot of vehicles driving fast. A 2017 street safety review done by the city confirms this. At the time, 85% of cars traveling here on Avenue Road were going way over speed limit, even in the school zone. Albert Cole regularly rides his bike here and finds the traffic can make trips dangerous for those sharing the roads and sidewalks. You're constantly looking over your shoulder uh, because anytime you hear a, a horn beep or a car brakes, uh, you're worried someone's going to mount the sidewalk. Just last month, 18-year-old Miguel Escanen was hit by a dump truck while on his bike in the same few blocks. The tragedy has given new urgency to a plan to revamp the busy road. What we've proposed is completely consistent with the city's plans about getting people to walk and cycle more, getting people out of cars. Early this year, the Avenue Road Safety Coalition enlisted the help of Brown and Story Architects to create Avenue Road, reinventing the avenue. The plan suggests reversing the lane widening that happened in the 1950s, which left sidewalks dangerously narrow. It proposes more than doubling sidewalk space and adding over 550 new trees. To do this, the current six lanes of traffic north of DuPont need to be pared down to four. It also includes an option to install bike lanes. 
myself and Councillor Matlow to the north, we have instructed city staff to start evaluating what potential there is to, to make Avenue a more inviting and a safer place. Councillor Mike Layton called the new plan beautiful, but says City Council still needs to go through it with engineers for feasibility. Hopefully we'll be able to re realize the whole thing and it won't be have too big of a price tag. He says they're also considering other ways of reducing speeding in the area, like red light cameras and infrastructure modifications as part of the city's commitment to reducing road fatalities. For coal, it's a road tragedy that brings, uh, brings sort of attention uh, from politicians on the problem. The plan goes to a virtual public meeting on Monday. Jessica Ng, CBC News, Toronto. A group of Ontario nurses held a rally at Young Dundas Square today demanding the province initiate a retention strategy to keep experienced nurses. If there's less nurses, then it's more work on the other nurses. I just think it's very important. I feel like a lot of the public doesn't quite grasp what's going on unless you're seeing this every day. And we're finally speaking out, and that means it's gotten to a very critical point. It's affecting patient care, it's affecting the public, and it's extremely dangerous. Today is just one of many recent protests from Ontario healthcare workers who say they have felt overworked and undervalued during the pandemic. Because many family doctors have gone virtual, nurses say patients are coming into emergency rooms for routine checkups, adding they see as many as 300 patients a day, and that is impacting patient care. It's grim, and I keep calling this the domino effect, because with every experienced nurse that we lose, there's one less there to train the next generation that's coming in. And we're, we're at this point where when, when someone quits because they just can't take it anymore, they have a profession they love, but they're burned out, they have PTSD, the, the workload is distributed on those who remain, and that becomes even greater. So it's just domino after domino, and we've seen an enormous number of nurses leaving our department, and it's impacting patient care. Among other things, protesters are asking the province to kill Bill 124. It was introduced by the Ford government in 2019 and limits annual salary, salary rather increases for nurses to 1%. At minimum, they are urging the province to match their salary increases with other frontline workers like police officers and firefighters. New data is shedding light on just how much treating a COVID-19 patient in hospital costs. And the price tag may surprise you. As Nali Kalada explains, it's roughly three times more expensive to treat someone in hospital with the virus than with a heart attack. The human and emotional cost can't be measured. But new data released today spells out the financial impact of COVID-19. We do know that we've already spent in hospital costs over a billion dollars on COVID-19 um, patients. According to the Canadian Institute for Health Information, the cost of treating patients with COVID-19 is more than $23,000, about three times higher than a patient with pneumonia, and about five times higher than someone with the flu. If the patient ends up in intensive care, the cost skyrockets to more than $50,000. The other thing that we looked at was comparing it to a kidney transplant which has an average cost of about $27,000, which you, you can understand the complexity of a kidney transplant patient is, is coming closer to the cost of hospitalization for a COVID-19 patient. All of it speaking to the complexity of care required. And the more complex the care, experts say, the higher the cost. We think that it's free because we don't have to pay when we walk through the door of a hospital you know, emergency room, but it's quite expensive. ICU doctor Jamie Spiegelman has seen the new numbers and isn't surprised. COVID patients stay in hospital a lot longer than heart attack patients. They use a lot of resources. They become ICU patients. They use more expensive drugs that we use to treat COVID. And they take a lot of resources to, to treat these patients in a long period of time. Experts also say the new data puts the strain on healthcare workers into context. No wonder we are seeing across the country reports of uh, healthcare workers being burned out, uh, taking early leave and so forth because of the demands that this disease is putting on us and this now puts it in fairly stark terms. The study looked at the cost of hospitalizations in Canada between January 2020 and March 2021. The data on the cost from the fourth wave of the pandemic up to September is expected to be released in December. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto.
No thunder and lightning waking me up last night, Colette, and a bit of a warm-up today. Yeah, I hope you got a good sleep there, <laughs> As Dwight. opposed to the other night, yeah. Yeah, yeah, lots of folks uh, probably happy to kind of take that in and have some quieter conditions. I'm going to talk to you here about temperatures. It's all relative with these things. You know, it just depends on what you compare it to, yesterday or tomorrow. Well, our conditions today, you know, I give you these norms, and really it's unusual to actually hit them right on anyway, but it's just kind of a guideline. So these are our normal highs and lows that we'd be seeing for this time of year. I've rounded this up just a tiny bit. We are at 20.8, so bringing you to 21. So very kind of close to seasonal. Uh, the difference is it's a five degree change from yesterday, right? So it did have a bit of a fall feel to it, and we're seeing that for a couple of days here. And then the temperatures are going to be warming back up as we go towards the weekend and getting back into those mid 20s. This is how it looks this evening. We've had mostly dry conditions, just a few little light sprinkles that came into the GTA. Where we're seeing it more consistent, though, is where we've been in to some of the wet weather here from about Hamilton, Burlington through that region towards Cambridge. You've been seeing this Haldeman County, uh, Brantford, Beamsville there, Welland and St. Catharines, Niagara region. So you've kind of been dealing with this off and on through the day as these little rounds have gone through. Not only there, but from about Port Hope eastward also a little more consistent with seeing some of that showery activity there pushing towards Kingston now. Tonight, an isolated shower certainly is possible into the city in the GTA, but we won't see too much of that. Temperature down to 12 degrees. And then tomorrow, this is what we're looking at. Some sunshine, quite a bit of it, but at times a bit more cloud cover like in the morning. The high is going up to 22. Thank you, Colette. You're welcome. Weather is brought to you by Train. To cool and clean the air in your home, it's hard to stop a train. Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. A commercial passenger flight left Kabul airport today, the first since the frantic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan at the end of August. 43 Canadians were among the estimated 200 foreigners on board, also including Americans and British nationals. And the U.S. says it expects more such efforts in the future. Tessa Arcelia reports now from London. And a warning, there are images in this story some viewers may find upsetting. Some 200 people, including Canadians, have flown out of Kabul airport on a Qatar Airways charter flight, the first such operation since U.S. forces left the country last month. After a stopover in Doha, passengers will then head to their final destinations. The international community has also set clear expectations of a Taliban-led government. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said the Taliban's relationship with the world hinges on its actions. The Taliban has made a series of commitments publicly and privately, including with regard to freedom of travel, uh, with regard to uh, combating terrorism and not allowing Afghanistan to be used as a launching point for terrorism, including uh, as well upholding the basic rights of the Afghan people. But not long after a new Taliban government was announced, reports of journalists being brutally tortured are emerging. <laughs> Taki Daryabi and Nimat Nagdi were covering a protest in Kabul their bodies covered in bruises. <laughs> Daryabi says a group of about seven or eight people beat him up and other journalists until they passed out. They were then locked up in a cell. Like many local journalists, they say if this continues, journalism in the country could stop altogether. Tess Arcelia, CBC News, London. Now, we remember those troubling images from the Kabul airport just days ago of Afghans desperately trying to escape the Taliban rule. Now we have the story of a former Canadian soldier and his heroic efforts to get as many out as he could. Judy Trin has more about the man known to Afghan refugees as Canadian Dave. This is what David Lavery saw when he walked around the Kabul airport. Tens of thousands fleeing the Taliban. The din of their despair echoes in his mind. Actually, it was pretty horrible. It's hard to process, but there's a constant hum, 24 and 7, um, of noise, of desperation, of panic. Lavery is a retired Canadian Special Forces soldier who operated a private security company in Kabul. After the embassy closed, Lavery remained at the airport to rescue refugees. <laughs> Amid the chaos, he had a list of more than 1,200 people who assisted Canadian soldiers in Afghanistan. Wendy Long was helping him from her Ontario home. There was very little sleep involved. 
Her group of volunteers use secure chat rooms to guide Afghans to safe houses and to the airport. I would say, Canadian Dave's looking for you, uh, you know, put, put whatever you have and start waving red and chanting Canada uh, so that he can, he can view you. Meanwhile, Lavery would use his cell phone to scan the crowds, allowing volunteers to see the rescues in real time. What's going to happen is we're going to take you and put you into our little Canadian enclave. The smiling faces on the other side of that gate, uh, it encouraged us to keep going. Lavery is credited with helping at least 100 people escape, but many more were left behind. You could hear people on the other side who knew me, David, don't leave us, David, don't leave us. We're here and they stayed there for days, you know, trying to get in, trying to get hope, but I couldn't open that door. Eleven days after Kabul fell, Lavery and his wife boarded a German transport plane. Not the way I expected to leave Afghanistan after all these years. Before the ramp closed, they heard explosions from a suicide attack. They were safe, but leaving a nation in tatters. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. The Ontario government has announced that it will not be making National Day for Truth and Reconciliation a provincial holiday. Legislation passed by the federal government in June recognized September 30th as a federal statutory holiday. That makes it a paid day off for federal workers and, and employed in federally regulated workplaces. The holiday was one of 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission meant to honor Canada's residential school survivors and families. Ontario says while it will not be Making it a provincial holiday this year, it will instead work with Indigenous communities to commemorate the day similar to Remembrance Day. For the second night in a row, the leaders of Canada's five main political parties will meet in a nationally televised debate, this time in English. With just seven days until Election Day, the latest polls put the Liberals and Conservatives neck and neck. CBC's Marina von Stockelberg has a preview of tonight's event. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau will try tonight to convince millions of voters he should be re-elected Prime Minister. But this morning, at a tour of a hospital in Ottawa, he tried to convince Catherine. I'm very undecided right now. That is fair enough. Uh, I uh, encourage you to keep watching and keep listening and decide on the kind of leadership that we need. Ahead of tonight's debate, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole dropped off his kids for their first day of school. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh shopped in an Ottawa store for baby clothes with his wife, who was expecting. Tonight, they'll join Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchet and Green Party leader Annemi Paul. This debate will cover five topics chosen by Canadians. Affordability, climate, COVID-19 recovery, leadership and accountability, and reconciliation. We got a taste of what's to come at yesterday's French language debate. Trudeau under fire for sending Canadians to the polls early. Why did you call elections, Mr. Trudeau? Why in the middle of a pandemic? Why have an election during a pandemic? And that's precisely because we need, Canadians need to have a say in how we get out of this. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole was on defense too, for waiting to release the cost of his platform until right before last night's debate and for his plan to scrap the Liberals' $10 a day childcare deal already signed with most provinces in favour of a tax credit. Viewers will be looking at um, leaders that are able to explain their policies, to explain them clearly and to explain why their policies are better than their adversaries. Not included in tonight's debate is People's Party of Canada leader Maxime Bernier. His party did not poll high enough at the start of the election to be included. His supporters have planned a protest outside of the debate location tonight. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. With 11 days to go, where does each party stand? Evan Dyer takes a closer look at that for us tonight, 26 days into the campaign. Back around Canada Day, the country looked very different. COVID numbers were down, Liberal numbers were up. All the indicators suggested, you know, a, a really strong position for, for the Liberals. For months, Canadians had seen mostly Liberals on their screens, dealing with the pandemic and denying they wanted an election. We don't want an election. Canadians don't want an election. We do not want an election. But as I've been consistently saying, we don't want an election. The summer numbers were very tempting, but still they dithered. Canada Day, the Liberals had a 10-point or higher lead in the polls, and by the time they called the election, it was only five points. 
Trudeau was struggling to explain why he needed a majority. People saw that why that was in his interest, but it was less clear to them why that was in their interest. The Conservatives had a new leader, and he was proving to be harder to land a clean hit on than his predecessors. I'd like to start today by announcing a very controversial position. I am a dog person. A person who is evidently not carrying social conservatism around in his bones the way uh, Andrew Scheer did. Uh, so I think that O'Toole had uh, terrible uh, standings uh, in the polls coming into this election. And as soon as people saw him, a lot of people said, well, that doesn't look too bad. It wasn't even the end of August before O'Toole's party pulled ahead in the polls. And there's an enthusiasm gap. Only about half of Liberals say they actually want a Trudeau majority government. It indicates a uh, an unmotivated Liberal vote in many ways to prevent an outcome they don't want as opposed to really wanting the Liberals uh, to govern. But Trudeau isn't the only one who faces problems with his base. Maxime Bernier, the only candidate willing to get arrested for his views, is drawing big crowds. Polling that I'm looking at has them in double digits in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario and Quebec. And there's no question that if you took those people's party votes and added them to the conservative vote total at the moment, they would win the election handily. Freedom, freedom, freedom. The People's Party is riding a wave of anger about COVID restrictions that's been mostly directed at Justin Trudeau. Yay! Yay! It's still not clear whether scenes like these will hurt him or help him. So excited, we're gonna be here all the time. Another wild card is the collapse of the Green Party's support. A leader who's fighting to keep her job rather than campaigning. Who's going to pick up those votes? The fate of the two biggest parties depends on the smaller parties. Will the bloc run strong in Quebec? How many younger voters will choose Jadmeet over Justin? Conventional wisdom says this is where the campaign really kicks off. If that's so, the Liberals are certainly starting in a very different place than where they expect it to be. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Gatton. Tis the season, Colette, and is that Hurricane Larry behind you? Yes, it is, Dwight, and yeah, talk about tis the season. It's just a coincidence that it happens to be that tomorrow is the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season, and tomorrow is also when this one, Hurricane Larry, will be passing by the Avalon Peninsula and having an impact on Newfoundland and Labrador. So the one thing I can say about it, when you've got a hurricane headed towards you, you do want to see it moving at a good clip because at least it means it's going to pass you by and any damage it does, well, it'll move on. So outer bands still having an impact there on Bermuda, but really it's passed by that because Sustained winds 150 kilometers an hour. It's a category one, but it is moving north northwest at just over 30 kilometers an hour, and that is decent movement. So that's why at least it won't linger. But you can see the path keeping it with the strength, although the winds will come down, but still allowing it to stay as a category one. And this is Friday night into Saturday, really almost a direct hit coming across the Avalon there in St. John's. So they are certainly looking at warnings now. Hurricane warning is in place there, but also wind warnings storm surges and really with winds that will be around 100 kilometers an hour but gusting to 130 there's certainly the risk of seeing some tree limbs coming down and power lines so that's what they're going to be dealing with as they head into this weekend there what we're dealing with then doesn't this just seem mild okay a bit of a nuisance in the Niagara region that we've been seeing these repeated showers kind of pushing through there temperatures dropping back other than winds are at 20 we're talking about some high teens overnight tonight though we'll see those falling a few areas may drop into the single digit nine degrees perhaps for the low tonight there into London and also tomorrow through the London area tonight and tomorrow the risk of a few more spotty showers we could even see through the overnight hours there's a little spotty shower kind of coming through short-lived but coming through uh, the downtown core even but into Friday otherwise we do get into some sunshine Friday night We'll get some clouds coming back, but Saturday sunshine again. So there's the temperature. Should hold those double digits at least around the GTA and all around the Golden Horseshoe here. But we are getting into some cooler air at times. Tomorrow the temperature comes up just a little bit from where it was today. Uh, looking pretty good. Again, some of those showers, if we see them, light in nature, but they're going to be just a little bit to the west of us. So this is the trend as we go towards Saturday. The temperature bumping back up. So kind of seasonal for tomorrow. Then Saturday into the 
the sunshine mid-20s. We'll likely hold there and see some humidity coming up into Sunday, but early Sunday, the early part of the day, I do have a risk of seeing some showers or thunderstorms kind of passing through as the front goes through. That puts the temperature down a little bit for Monday, and then guess what? Yeah, it looks like there's not a lot of agreement or complete agreement, but it looks like we could see a bump in those numbers as we go into mid-next week once again. Yeah, the overall daytime temps are looking good, Colette. Thank yeah, you. It, it's very summer-like still. Hey, we're still in summer. Thank you, Colette. You're welcome. If you're like many people these days, you've probably noticed you're making online purchases a lot more often. Businesses are taking note too and figuring out how to up their digital presence in order to keep their customers. That was part of the agenda at a summit of business leaders and politicians today. I'm going to write a cop now with the details. The economy is far from where it was before the pandemic, but today business leaders got together to talk recovery and where they've been. Overnight, merchants have had to figure out how to sell their stuff online. Fine dining establishments are creating takeout menus. The summit, called Stronger Than Ever, ran videos between the speakers, a reminder of the realities for businesses this past year and a half. The Premier appeared virtually. Ontario's vaccine certificate is another step to ensure we don't need to return to lockdowns and will give our business community the comfort to continue operating. It's a policy Doug Ford and his government only recently supported. It comes into place September 22nd. An increasing number of businesses had been asking for it. The pandemic has meant more digital and tech, whatever the industry or size of company. We talk only about the big companies, but under the top of these icebergs, are just this massive ecosystem that's rising. Right. And so clearly tech is at the heart of what our economies will be for the coming years and decades. Housing is an industry that never suffered, instead taking off. As for the rest of the economy, according to one bank economist. We do think the recovery still has some ways to go, but we do remain upbeat. We think that we will be back to something close to normal uh, by the middle part of 22, uh, 2022 for, uh, for the regional economy. He says tourism, restaurants and gyms will likely be the slowest to rebound. I would say it's a bright future considering the situation in the past 18 months. Here's one change this tourism and hospitality professor expects from pre-pandemic times. I think it's going to be taken taking a long time before people do those, you know, one day, one of a night trip, you know, to New York or to Vancouver or this kind of thing, just for, for quick business. It's not going to happen again anytime soon. Remember those busy conventions? He does think those will be back since it's harder to have hundreds of people meeting over Zoom. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. As we head to break, here's a look at where the markets close today. The TSX closed down by 37 points. The Dow also falling by 151. And our dollar trading higher at 79.03 cents US. We'll be right back. Back to Toronto's International Film Festival now, which begins tonight. Last year, TIFF took place largely online due to COVID-related travel and theater restrictions. This year, some red carpet events are back, and so are the Hollywood stars, and so is our Tashana Reed. She is at Roy Thompson Hall. And Tashana, you're on the red carpet for opening night. Tell us about this film that's about to premiere, and you've got a star with you, it looks like. Uh, Dwight, not only am I on the red carpet for the Toronto International Film Festival, it's been two years since I've done this, but I'm here with the film star, okay, Ben Platt for Dear Evan Hansen, the opening night film. Ben, let's get to it. You've been waiting patiently. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Of First off, how does it feel to be on the red carpet premiere of Dear Evan Hansen tonight? It feels very overwhelming, really gratifying, exciting. You know, we, we made this film during COVID and a very kind of isolated and, and anxious environment and really had the goal in mind the whole time of when we would finally get to connect with real people and watch real people you know see the story and feel seen by the story so the fact that we're finally at that day I feel a lot of relief really excited you know I was one of the lucky ones who was able to see this production when it came here in Toronto I know some audiences will know uh, this story very well but for people who haven't had a chance to see it uh, who will be watching it in theaters I mean what are they going to get from this story I think it's a lot about just human connection and how deeply we all 
want that and the different ways in which we behave that might suggest otherwise, but um, really encourages people deep down to try to take a minute to get to know someone and to see what their struggle is because everybody has some struggle going on, whether it presents obviously or not. And I feel like more so than, than any film at this moment, it's, it's all about feeling part of a collective, part of a community and feeling seen and, and, and like we're one, one human race. So I feel like it's kind of the perfect film for this current moment where isolation and loneliness and lack of connection are unfortunately more universal than they've ever been. Absolutely. Um, so I'm hoping it'll be a nice antidote for that. I mean, you talk about, of course, these themes, mental health and, and people struggling with isolation. This pandemic has been really tough on so many people, especially young people. Uh, what do you hope is the message that they'll take away after they see this film? Just that they feel seen and heard and that any struggle, no matter what it looks like or, you know, what privileges are present or not present or what your life looks like I think everybody's entitled to have a hard time and to, to not be fully together and I hope that it will be a comfort and will also help people feel like maybe we're moving towards a more hopeful redemptive place finally and crossed fingers um, yeah well, well said I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening I know you have to get going thanks again for taking the time to speak with us Pleasure. Thanks for having me. nice to meet you Ben well Dwight that was Ben Platt of course he's the star of Dear Evan Hansen and as I mentioned this was a, a musical a Broadway hit it won six Tony Awards in 2017 and it actually had a limited run here in Toronto uh, at the Royal Alexandra Theatre so some Toronto audiences uh, might actually be very familiar with the production or they might have seen it uh, in New York but it is a story about this young teen who deals with social anxiety disorder and as he's struggling his therapist suggests to him to write letters to himself to kind of share positive affirmations and he does this but one of those letters ends up in the hands of another student and then begins this story uh, where there is a bit of a, a deception that happens and Ben does benefit from this but it's really hard for him to uh, tell the truth and open up because he's gained all these new friends now this is a story that deals with teen suicide, uh, mental health issues, and uh, you get to see the impacts on not only young people, but their families. I also had a chance to speak with Julianne Moore, uh, who plays uh, Evan Hansen's mother, and she was just speaking with me as well, and she said that this is a story that is just so timely for this moment, for uh, the time that many people have been struggling with in terms of different themes, such as mental health and so forth, and she said she hopes that people get the message that they're not alone. So uh, that has kind of been the message here on this carpet. I must say, uh, we've also seen Amanda Stenberg. Uh, I had a chance as well to, uh, as I mentioned, speak with uh, Julianne Moore, but also the director of this film adaptation. And it is the world premiere. This is the first red carpet that TIFF has had since 2019. So a very big moment for festival organizers. I had a chance as well to speak with them, and they said it's just so great uh, to be able to bring this to to Toronto again. Uh, it's not exactly the same as, <laughs> as we're used to seeing. We're not seeing fans screaming outside and fan zones and whatnot, but um, it's still a special moment to uh, be able to bring uh, some in-person interaction and of course uh, audience members who will be inside here at Roy Thompson Hall to see the film. Love seeing you back on the red carpet, Tashana. Love the fact that I throw to you and right away you bring me the star of the movie. And I don't know, I'm also loving the fact that you're rocking the, bla the braids for TIFF this year. Thank you, Tashada. You're welcome. That's tonight, call it. Yes, I, I've got to record it, actually, because I have something going on. So nobody tweet me, don't send me texts. I don't know. I don't want to know. I want to just kind of watch it and take that in. Wishing her such good luck. Uh, tonight, we've got a low of 12 degrees coming your way, and a few isolated showers are possible. But then tomorrow, 22 have a nice day on tap on Friday and some heat coming back into the weekend mid 20s return with uh, early day some showers possible and thunderstorms on Sunday Dwight. Thank you Colette. You're welcome. That is our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Colette Ewan has your next local news tonight at 11 right after the national. We will see you back here tomorrow at 6. Stay safe and have a great night everybody. Go Layla.